Good morning, everyone. So today is my great pleasure to welcome Professor Alexandrova um, to our CIT webinar talk today. And uh, let's go over a quick introduction of Professor Alexandrova. So she obtained a bachelor and master's degree in chemistry from Saratov University in Russia. And then she obtained her PhD from Utah State University in theoretical physical chemistry with Professor Alexander uh, Bodia and working on the novel small inorganic clusters and then develop uh, uh, and also the development of general theory of chemical bonding. And uh, after that, she started the uh, postdoc in computational biochemistry at Yale University with Professor um, William Tully, also at Yale, uh, uh, with Professor William um, Jorgensen, and then worked as an um, American Cancer Society postdoc fellow in biophysics with um, Professor John Tully, and which is also at Yale University. She joined the uh, UCLA in 2009, and her research is focusing on the design of new functional materials incited by electronic structures and chemical bonding, especially on the heterogeneous catalysis, a highly dynamic interface. So today, Professor Alexandrova will give us a talk on the heterogeneous catalysis um, which is uh, the heterogeneous catalyst set in motion by reaction conditions, which will be ensembles of metal stable uh, state break the rules of catalysis. So let's welcome Professor Nadova again and enjoy the talk. Okay, thanks very much, Shiyun. Uh, thanks everybody for showing up. Um, there was a small confusion, which is there was a, some Webex link or something like this. So actually, I tried to join there first, and Chong also tried to join there. So Paul, if you could direct him to the right place, that'd be nice because I think he is trying to see all us somewhere else. Okay, so um, let me share my slides. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak at your center series of seminars. Um, so Sheyun did a very nice job introducing what's going on in my group, but just to recap, we have a wide array of interests um, from dynamic uh, interfaces and heterogeneous catalysis, which, which, uh, which is what I'll focus on today. But we also are interested in various other problems, such as electrochemi electrochemistry for CO2 capture and conversion. Um, we designed some qubits and interfaces decorate, decorated with qubits so for quantum information science. We look a bit at quantum materials. We also have quite a program on enzymes, particularly metalloenzymes trying in, to install non-physiological metals and proteins and fundamentally uh, developing protocols to detect and utilize and understand how nature uses electric fields, intermolecular electric fields and enzymatic catalysis. Actually, I think it's quite informative area also for heterogeneous catalysis when we try to create microenvironments at electrodes, things like this, where we design solvent and, uh, and, and, and bring ions from solution to the electrode, things of that nature. So um, all of these directions sort of cross talk to each other and that's, I think it's very fruitful. Uh, oh, and the direction on toxicology, I didn't mention that's very interesting actually we work with the uh, Los Angeles Department uh, of Firefighter Union, in fact, and, uh, and try to classify their carcinogens. So it's very, very interesting and um, certainly a very rewarding direction. So I'll focus on uh, dynamic catalysts today. Um, uh, for sure, this center doesn't need an introduction to catalysis, but perhaps for students and the audience, the key questions, fundamental questions in heterogeneous catalysis are, what's the nature of the active site or sites? Um, and what are my principles of design? Um, and of course, we want catalysts that are cheaper, more selective, more active, and so on, green also, and multifunctional, which is of interest to the center, and so on and so forth. So, but first uh, things first, what are the fundamental principles behind the catalytic event? and what are my active sites. And so uh, the concept that we've been pushing for the last few years, and that actually gave us quite a bit of mileage, is the following. So in heterogeneous catalysis, which is very much engineering dominated community, the notion has been for, for a long time that we look for the most stable form of the catalyst. Um, for example, it could be a pristine surface, 111 of a metal that doesn't go anywhere, but even for something more dynamic, such as surface supported clusters, which is what I like to focus on. The focus has been on the global minimum. So global minimum meaning most stable form of, of, of a given cluster. 
By the way, finding the global minimum is also not trivial. So unlike uh, one, one, one surface, or say an organic metallic complex where you definitely know a lot about the structure, here it's not so trivial to find what that, 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 that form actually is. So you need quite a bit of sampling that uh, would, would and, and, and uh, tricks to sample if efficiently until you can find the global minimum. But also in the sampling process, you will quickly learn that actually there are many, many competing minima which are close in the energy to the global minimum that, uh, that you might have found. And in this cartoon here in the lab, these are results from actual simulations uh, where we have a fixed number of copper atoms, only three, four in, in this catalyst, but varying number of oxygen atoms. And they're sitting on amorphous aluminous support. So they also differ in the site on the support which they occupy. And so all this minima, again, can be very close in their free energies, free energies in the sense that they exchange with the gas phase in this case. And so if you put your RT line somewhere here, you quickly find that many minima are actually thermally accessible. And if that's the case, then my catalyst is not just one global minimum, but instead cartoon number two is soup of many states simultaneously present. Some of them are coming and going, oh, actually all of them come and go. And, uh, and um, if, you, if, you, if you're familiar with enzymatic cells, that's certainly very natural territory to sort of sample the states of the catalyst and, and produce ensemble average quantities. So here we're talking about really changing shape, stoichiometry, location and the support, uh, and all of this contributes to the nature of my ensemble. And then if we think of which ones of them are actually doing my catalytic turnovers, if we're lucky, it's the global minimum because it's the most prevalent shape of the catalyst uh, uh, in, in reaction conditions. Um, so yes, in the modeling, by the way, I forgot, I was supposed to mention that we try to in, 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 in include reacting, reaction conditions as much as possible, meaning temperature, partial pressures of gases. If it's electrochemistry, then charging of the electrode, introducing electrolyte with compensating charge that's distributed through Poisson Boltzmann distribution or sometimes explicit solvent. And so with all these conditions, you have this ensemble of different states pre present to different degree, depending on their accessibility. Uh, so I already said that we're lucky if the global minimum was the catalyst, but as chemists, we also quite naturally suspect that stuff that's less uh, stable should be more reactive. So in fact, it's not a, a, a completely heretic hypothesis that actually maybe all the catalytic turnovers are driven by metastable states in this ensemble. Maybe something just with this very special site that comes and goes, and for a while that it exists, it does all the catalytic turnovers that goes away. But on average, ensemble picture of, of reactivity gives you certain ensemble average rate, and you don't know actually which one or ones uh, domin which states of the catalyst dominated that rate. So that's sort of the, the theory that, that we put together. Then our responsibility as theorists is, of course, to discover ensemble as full as possible, treat every property as an ensemble average property. And if they're governed by the minima, for example, it could be spectral signature, then the most prevalent species will be dominant. But if it's about rate, then it could be that something that's less populous could be governing the rate. That's very interesting. It's very annoying view on the catalytic interface, I have to say, because it, it just increased our um, amount of work exponentially, but actually provides extremely interesting insights and in both explaining experimental results and actually predicting experiment that was uh, subsequently uh, shown, uh, predictions were shown to be to be correct um, in collaboration with experiment. So yes, all the efforts in, in this, most of the efforts in this field are, for me, are very collaborative with experimentalists. We certainly talk regularly um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and that's very important to keep theory in check. Okay. Let me show you first very, very, very simple baby system, which is not a real catalyst. Nobody would ever use this for real catalysis, but it's interesting because it illustrates the point that metastable state could be the one that actually contains the active site. And it's shown in this theory experiment collaboration. The good thing is that in this system, because it's so tiny, there are only two minima, the global minimum and what we call LM1, local minimum one. Um, whereas normally in surface supported clusters with really hundreds or tens of, um, of minima, so it's very difficult actually to experimentally pinpoint which one is the, the catalytic site. So here we have um, this palladium copper hydride, anionic because it's mass selected, 
produced by Kit Bowen. And Kit Bowen uh, then obtains photo electron spectra of these clusters first without any reagent said. And uh, yeah, so photo electron spectroscopy for students, right? It's photoelectric effect. You walk this thing with a laser of high energy. You have some outgoing electrons that are photo detached. They have different kinetic energy depending on which orbital they came from. And by the time of arrival to the detector, you can back out kinetic energy and therefore orbital energy from which it came. And so that's the nature of the photo electron spectroscopy. It's effectively fingerprint of your orbital structure. So in the initial hydride, we see signatures from two different isomers, which again is the global minimum and what we call LM1, local minimum one. Um, it's uh, not very result spectrum, unfortunately, but we think uh, we can fit two, two species in it. And then CO2 is fed to, to, the, to the chamber. This is a gas phase reaction, obviously. And then we have all sorts of force of peaks, which, can attribute, which can, we can attribute theoretically through a question of motion couple cluster theory. This is way beyond the T. If, if, if you're interested to, to, to the spectral features, we find various adducts of CO2 to this species and so on. And one thing that has been a puzzle to us for a long time this is this feature is at 2.5 electron volt because nothing seems to have an electron detachment energy like this until we actually compute the reaction profiles for our two species reacting with CO2, so redu undergoing reduction to formate or formic acid. And what we found is that the global minimum has very catalytically incompetent reaction profiles. It's really not catalytic, very hindered kinetically. LM1 has flatter and nicer reaction profile. And on that reaction profile, we find a species that has a photo detachment at 2.5 UV, which we took as a signature of the fact that that's the catalytic profile that takes place. And therefore LM1 and not GM is the catalytic moiety. Now, in reality, Again, the really interesting, practically interesting interfaces are considerably more complicated and I'll focus the rest of my talk on them. So here, this is a very interesting problem of interest to US Air Force, which is they have this hypersonic jets that from friction with air overheat. And typically what they do is they put them on the ground for cooling. They present us with a problem to cool these jets with fuel which sounds counterintuitive at first, but really all we want is a catalyst that would catalyze uh, an endothermic process. Uh, so for fuel being large alkanes, we want partial dehydrogenation, with, which is endothermic, to, for example, an olefin, such that it would not proceed any further. So it has to be a selective catalyst that wouldn't go all the way to coke. Industrially, in dehydrogenation, what people do to push chemical equilibrium of the system away from coke is they co-feed hydrogen. So there's excess hydrogen always present. But in the, in the hypersonic jet, you really don't want to do this because you might explode. So what you do instead, we try to play with the we try to design this catalyst to be selective otherwise, not through chemical equilibrium with um, argument, but somehow through the, the composition may be an atom count. So our typical architecture with which we work is uh, a semiconductor decorated with small platinum clusters with a uh, um, countable number of platinum atoms and they're mass selected to have a really good control over what we have in the system. And also we play with a, an alloying element. You can hardly call it dopant that, that kind of concentration that we're talking here and also M number of the so dopant elements. And, and through this, we're actually able to achieve some really interesting catalytic um, um, performances of, of this supported platinum clusters. This work is collaborative with Scott Anderson in University of Utah, who has the sole capabilities of preparing mass selected clusters, supporting them on surfaces, doing uh, reactivity studies, some spectroscopy, XPS, uh, ISS, and so on. Uh, so um, I'm, I'll be showing you a mix of theory and experiment here because they're really not separable. Um, so here, first, very fundamental question, apart from this application that I just showed you, we, we looked at just the performance of size selected clusters of platinum of the size four, seven, and eight, one cluster size at the time, supported on alpha alumina, catalyzing this, this process. And what we, we did uh, is we took ethylene as a proxy for this olefin intermediate that we would like to dissolve rather than dehydrogenate further. So starting from an alkane would be, of course, a very good thing to do, but he doesn't have a high pressure reactor in combination with all these other experimental capabilities. And also really looking at, at, the, at this intermediate makes most sense because that's where the, the bifurcation point in the mechanism really is. That's what we want, don't want to dehydrogenate more deeply. So here we're looking at temperature program desorption of ethylene, which is deuterated, which means he prepares the size selected clusters, feeds ethylene, which is deuterated increases the temperature. And at certain temperature, he sees maximum of desorption of D2 that's leaving deuterated 
ethylene. So at this temperature, for example, for PT7, we have maximum activity. And also the peak height is telling us how active the, the given cluster size is. And these curves uh, that are in solid lines, we'll not discuss today, there's no time. But the first interesting question that really illustrates my point um, is this difference between platinum seven and eight. So similar in size. So why such radically different activity with respect to ethylene dehydrogenation, which again is a bad process, just to be sure that we remember that. PT8 somehow is similar to PT4. So we want to answer this question first and actually it illustrates very important points uh, in this talk today. So for some reason it stops the okay, here we go. So again, as I told you, what we need to do first is perform the sampling of the free energy, potential energy surface or free energy surface of these clusters, find the global minimum and all like as many as possible thermally accessible isomers of the system. So if we are in this way, find the global minimum for platinum seven on aluminum. In platinum eight, what you see are these two structures. They're not super different. They're somewhat globular. They make some contacts with the support. Delta Q is the amount of charge that these clusters draw from the support. So they're negatively charged. They take a little bit more than an electron and the charge is magically equal in the two. So nothing really suggests that they should have such radically different reactivities. However, if we use this paradigm that actually it's not one cluster form, but many that may be present in reaction conditions and start expanding my ensemble toward more states that the system actually can populate, we see a divergence in behavior. So here in, in this P number, this is Boltzmann probability of being occupied at an indicated temperature. So it's 700 Kelvin. And before any reagents arrived, the global minimum of platinum seven is about 66% of the population. Give and take, this is dirty DFT, exponential when you talk about probability. So all the ATRs are amplified here. Take it qualitatively, please. So, but, but, but interestingly then, uh, at, uh, there is also a fair number of um, clusters that sit in this very different form, which is flatter, it wets the support, it, it forms more contacts with the surface and takes more electrons from it. Uh, a family of such isomers, it's quite populated at uh, 700 Kelvin, just as a reminder, is the tail of TPD uh, spectrum here. For platinum eight though, we have qualitatively different behavior. The first uh, isomer that's accessible, that's above the global minimum is like this. So it's first of all less populated than the LM1 for platinum seven. And also it's more globular. It features more platinum platinum bonds and fewer platinum support bonds. And as a result takes less electrons from the support. So in fact, if you so if you compute all this minimum, which I don't show in this slide, and calculate ensemble average charge on this cluster, which means for every cluster we take the computer charge weighed by Boltzmann probability to exist and sum this up to produce quality, uh, average ensemble average charge, what you will see is that my platinum seven and platinum eight diverge as a function of temperature, which temperature to me just means ensemble size. Okay, so from this, and you will see in a second that this charge is actually very important for activating ethylene. So this divergence is beha in behavior is suggestive of the differences in the catalytic activity that these clusters are going to show. So I showed you just two isomers for platinum seven. The bitter reality is like this. So before any reagent seven arrive, we have that many minima, at least, that are thermodynamically and kinetically accessible. So here we computed the full um, um, isomerization network for these different isomers or as full as we could get it, a uh, network that connects all these isomers, about 30 of them. Um, and from the barriers of backward and forward isomerization, we see that all of them can be visited in under, under one nanosecond. So really this is the state of my catalyst, not one minimum, but this soup before any reagents even bind. When they bind, they bind in many different configurations, expanding my ensembles by that much again. And then from there, creating that many reaction profiles, okay? So you cannot really say there's one reaction profile. You cannot put it in the paper. People do it all the time, I know. But for these kinds of catalysts, you really cannot. You, I think you should be talking about hundreds of reaction profiles and ensemble average rates and thermodynamics from there. So um, <clears throat> in fact, here we are lucky because for ethylene dehydrogenation, we have a convenient proxy for how likely a given ethylene configuration is to undergo dehydrogenation rather than desorption. So we don't need to calculate that many reaction profiles. Uh, in some other cases, we have to. But here we know that uh, ethylene can bind to platinum in two different ways. First, so-called pi mode, where both carbons bind to one platinum and they retain sp2 hybridization, or they can bind in disigma mode, both go sp3 and bind two, two platinums and actually use two unpaired spins on platinum. So what we do then is we take my soup of many, many clusters, bind up to three ethylenes per cluster, which we know from the experiment is the number, 
sample their configurations, and then count the percentage of my population that bound ethylene, or count the percentage of ethylene that's bound in this di-sigma mode as an indicator of how likely it's go, how, how active it is. And what we find, for example, for platinum seven is that it, it increased coverage with ethylene and also increased temperature. Again, remember, temperature in this case means populating more and more states that are negative, more negatively charged. We have an avalanche of activation events. There's a typer here, which, uh, which indicates that uh, we should uh, just really dehydrogenate ethylene very viciously. And long story short for here, because for platinum eight, we have qualitatively different ensemble of states populated at higher temperature. We have harm, harmed activities compared to platinum seven. So people knew for a long time in this field that every atom counts. Platinum 7 got to be you know, different from Platinum 8, but they could never tell why. And theorists usually would look at just most active cluster size and explain somehow how orbital arguments so nice papers. But I think it's the first time that we actually said this is why we have a difference in activity that depends on cluster size, at least in this case, it's a property of the ensemble. I want to tell you this very exciting and very, very recent story um, of uh, how we can tame this uh, uh, dehydrogenation activity. Um, so first we had a theoretical prediction that adding a little bit of germanium to these clusters should create an interesting electronic effect that all those unpaired spins that are in platinum clusters should be quenched to form polar covalent bonds with germanium. And because unpaired spins are good for activating ethylene, we now harm the activity toward ethylene dehydrogenation. We now also know that it's two points. So if you put too much germanium, you can actually harm alkane dehydrogenation in the first place. But here, um, Scott, uh, I value this collaborator beyond words. So, so many times he followed our predictions and showed them to be true. He, he had a faith in us and I appreciate it very deeply. We are not decoration DFT in this case and I'm proud of it. So here he tried to deposit platinum clusters on alumina and then through ALD-like process, germinate them. So here we have already a familiar TPD experiment for ethylene desorption and D2 desorption from deuterating ethylene on platinum-4 versus platinum-4 germanium, which is a composition he can prepare. And what you see is this is several cycles of TPD. So he's cycling the temperature. And as he does it for platinum clusters, they undergo deeper. So they dehydrogenate all the ethylenes to, to nothing, to carbon. And so all my platinum sites get coked. They get poisoned. And so dehydrogenation activity is also going down. Essentially, the catalyst kills itself. But for platinum for germanium, the story is somewhat different. First, the activity does go down a little bit, but it retains, the cluster retains ethylene binding sites. Yet it stops dehydrogenating. It dehydrogenates very little from the beginning as we predicted, but also that goes down and essentially goes to zero. So the mystery here is how come it retains the sites and how come it, 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 it seems to still be selective and what's going on here. So it's actually a very interesting story also from the point of view, I already walked you through this, as to um, how, they, uh, how important this metastable states can be. So just structures first, okay, platinum four, platinum four germanium, various local minima, different accessibility, different, well, very similar actually amount of charge transfer from the support from alumina in this case. Um, and then let's look at the activity. So first, platinum four germanium, can easily dehydrogenate ethane. That's no problem. There are many profiles accessible. I'm singling out this LM prime, which here is LM2. And um, the, its proximity to the global minimum actually changes depending on what's bound to, to it. And you'll see in a second why it's so important. So then, OK, we dehydrogenate ethylene, no problem. Um, if we look at ethylene, most reaction profiles from these clusters are too uphill to dehydrogenate. So global minimum, for instance, is not really a happy guide to dehydrogenate, but LM prime, which is this structure, suddenly really is pulled down in energy when it binds ethylene compared to, the, to, the, to this situation here. It's because the binding is strong, it's di-sigma, and that guy has an accessible barrier for dehydrogenation. Once we dehydrogenate ethylene, so what's going on? It's not a selective catalyst, right? We have this species that can actually dehydrogenate. and because my catalyst constantly isomerizes, will be repopulating that LM prime all the time. And so slowly, all my catalysts will be sucked into the sink. So what's going on? Uh, and by sink, what I mean is once we dehydrogenate ethylene, there's no way back. It will really dehydrogenate to carbon. What we find, okay, is acetylene, once acetylene is dehydrogenated, this guy produces this species here where two carbons are embedded into the cluster. Interestingly, this is the only isomer that this cluster can access. It's very, very stable. It's not a soup anymore, a blessing for theorists, of course. And what we find is that this guy is actually very selective. So first, okay, first, first thing, we ask Scott, 
we think there is carbon in this system. Can you measure carbon in the cluster? And he measured, and of course, platinum-4 cokes, we know that. Platinum-4 germanium also shows a substantial carbon signal. We know that it doesn't coke, it retains ethylene binding sites. So if we look at the activity, this cluster is very good at dehydrogenating ethane. And, uh, and dehydrogenation of ethyl ethylene, though, is harmed. So now we don't have any, any profiles that would be very good. So there, there's maybe some barriers that are sort of surmountable, but vast majority of them would not dehydrogenate. So what we concluded from this study, it contains many more components, is that actually this partially coked cluster is unable to cook further. It's self-limiting coking that's enabled due to synergistic electronic relationship with the germanium. What germanium happened to do, so carbon is an oxidant. And if there would be no germanium, then it would take electrons from platinum. And in this way, affect the reactivity of platinum, inviting more and more coke. But when there's germanium, germanium effectively puts electrons into the, in, in, into the carbon two unit and platinum remains intact. It's platinum just like in an in initial platinum cluster, which retains then its activity, but, uh, but then as platinum for germanium does not dehydrogenate more deeply besides that one isomer. So that's the story. So if we form the self-limiting poisoning effect, which we discovered by complete accident, and I think we found a way to, we want to see if this is somehow general, if we can stabilize this cluster catalyst for practical applications, because usually they're not very practicable. They're unstable with respect to poisoning and also sintering, forming larger nanoparticles. And we wouldn't find it if we wouldn't look at this LM prime thing. Okay, so I don't have, I, I'm really actually surprisingly short on time because I try to explain this stuff in great detail. We, there's an electrocatalysis part here, um, but I'll take you actually to, to, to this slide here, um, um, which is um, with this paradigm, we visited quite a few things. So we designed for selectivity in a number of studies together with experiment. We looked at operando spectroscopy, which, um, is invaluable, of course, at trying to pin down what's happening with the catalyst and reaction conditions. But if it's an ensemble averaged spectrum, then it's dominated by the global minimum. And in cases when we want those metastable species, there'll be noise in the spectrum. And actually, then theory is indispensable in finding that little noise that's actually responsible for catalysis. But we need some new ways also to interpret, for example, operandoxanes, which is in this paper so that I'm citing. Now I showed you and maybe it wasn't obvious, but what I try to illustrate is that depending on what's binding to the, to the cluster catalyst, the ensemble reorganizes. So reorganization of the catalyst is an intrinsic part of the reaction coordinate. And also minima and barriers could be controlled by different species in the ensemble. For this reason, we routinely break scaling relations. We actually can break them on on purpose in, in the correct way that is, we think. So we made a prediction at the moment and it's being follow up, pull, followed up on with experiment where we showed how we can use this feature to design catalysts that break scaling relations in a good way and specifically <clears throat> making ORR catalysts that have lower overall potential. And we extended this concept to electrocatalysts to amorphous, amorphous interfaces that are not cluster based. And we revised Ostwell theory actually in a process of centering, how to describe centering when we're in this uh, sub nano cluster regime. With this, these are just my observations at the moment. There are catalysts in which there are so, so much in motion in, in reaction conditions that we have to be thinking of them as ensembles, which break all sorts of rules, such as scaling relations and Ostwell theory. We, I think we become indispensable for some operandos spectroscopists to, to deal with their spectra. Um, less stable can be more reactive, okay? And many concurrent reaction pathways have to be considered at the same time. Okay, um, and so for this center, I guess in the interest in, in my persona could be possibly in the fact that we cover a large space in possible systems, heterogeneous, homogeneous in collaboration with some of you guys here, with Paolo, with Chong, um, and enzymatic, um, and we draw experience and cross-pollinate among these three thermal and electro uh, catalysis also. We have all sorts of tools, electronic structures, our workhorse, um, we can do solvation, we can do sampling. That's a, a kitchen in my backyard, uh, how to sample effectively in the presence of partial pressures, potential solvent electrolyte. We can do a little bit of ML, definitely capital spectroscopy and um, some interest here. I'll take you here to this maybe, or here, maybe even more interesting. And we can discuss, thank you for your attention.
Um, thank you so much for uh, the nice presentation. So I guess uh, if you guys have any questions, um, so maybe the students and postdocs can ask the questions. If you have any. And I know that we tend to overwhelm. So yes, go ahead, who's speaking? Hi, uh, sorry, I don't know, Sasha. Uh, I have a question. I remember we, you assigned us to the metastable group for the class Hi. last quarter. So I kind of remember this a little, but yeah. I guess I had a question related to, cause I think in here you talk mostly about kind of like thermal catalysis or like, so I, I guess like I'm a bit more interested in like the electrocatalysis side. So how like, so you're saying like the temperature kind of plays like the cutoff for what's considered like medicine, like accessible at a certain temperature. So at different potentials, like what's dictating that cutoff for like electrochemistry? Okay, excellent question. And too bad I didn't have time to go into electro. Um, um, the, of course, temperature in electrocatalysis is lower and that's not a factor, but what is a factor is the electrochemical potential. And so the nature of the catalyst can really change as a function of the potential. For example, here we're looking at platinum four on graphite. And the model here is that we charge the electrode and there's a compensating electrolyte implicitly treated. And what you see is we swap the potential, we can reorganize the clusters. For example, uh, here, this is the prevalent form uh, and the cluster has no adsorbates, but as we change the potential, the square cluster becomes uh, more prevalent. And that's because they have different sensitivity to this additional or re removed electrons, even a fraction of, uh, uh, and different polarizability, you may say. And when, when there's an adsorbate, for example, an ORR, the relative, relative relevant adsorbates are OOH and OOH, we have always a different picture. We can have different isomers emerging that were not even present on the bare catalyst. Under some adsorbates, there is a whole soup of coexisting structures. So this is a very much a deciding factor, electrochemical potential as to what's accessible. But certainly cutoff is a lot lower in terms of what's accessible because it's room temperature for the most part. Cool, and okay. And then, so I guess one other follow-up question for that is um, for, I feel like, or from what I've seen so far, it's mostly, clusters of atoms so then i guess is there like a minimum where it this wouldn't like metastable states won't have as much of an impact like if it's just one atom or two atoms or like what point does this become like more relevant mm. so single atom of course could be nice if you if so the only diversity you may have on single atom is its coordination like if it kicks off a ligand for example but in any or where it sits on the on the on the surface but in general of course there's much more manageable number of isomers when it's a single atom when it's a very large nanoparticle there is a possibility that the dynamics is also different and confined to a couple of monolayers at the surface there are also systems which really don't go anywhere there are really catalysts that are metal one 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 most stable termination and it doesn't go anywhere so that, that's possible um depends in a way clusters tiny clusters are most extreme example and a poster child of this dynamics which i picked to illustrate the point most aggressively um but okay the concept applies across across catalysts i think but it could be mo more modest yeah okay thank you you're welcome So do we have any other questions? Uh, I have one question actually. Um, so at what, so how far apart are these clusters and like, could there be cluster cluster interaction? Maybe it's like two neighboring clusters. Is mm -hmm. that even worth looking at or is it just too crazy at this point? Okay. In, in real catalysis, it's not crazy at all. Um, and uh, and there is more to this, which is that clusters would sinter eventually, form larger nanoparticles, either through meeting and coalescing, or by monomers moving around and meeting with larger bigomers and staying there. Um, in principle, it's one of the things that we want to mitigate uh, through through design uh, to keep the cluster size that we want. Um, in the experiment with which I work, we try to, experimentalists try to control it to a maximum possible degree. So they prepare mass selected clusters and put them at small coverage. 
so that majority of their clusters at least are isolated and not together. Of course, there could be some tiny fraction that are on top of each other. In which case, say, instead of platinum four, we'd have a little bit of platinum eight that contaminates, but I think it's at the level of noise and we, in the model, we ignore it, okay? Um, and also the fact, so, and the fact that size specific activities preserved in the experiment also tells us that they are far enough apart to at least not center in the time scale of several TPDs that we apply to, to the systems. But in, in practical catalysis, Hutan, you're right, of course, yes. Right, thank Where you have heterogeneity of sizes and also prepared maybe in a messier way, yeah. I also have a question about the size. So uh, all of the model is doing on the surface, right? So um, are we just like assuming the surface is like infinitely big or do we set up any periodic, periodic bond, uh, boundary conditions on that? Or, I mean, just like how we, are you determining how big the scope should be for each system? Right. So this is done in periodic boundary conditions, everybody. Yeah. So we have a unit cell that's repeated in X, Y, and Z. So X and Y are the slab and Z is vacuum or solvent, a fairly thick layer. And then it's repeated also in the Z in that way. And the X and Y dimension, so the Z is so that the slabs wouldn't feel each other. Uh, but the X and Y are such that the clusters wouldn't feel each other. For example, adsorption energy of a cluster would be insensitive anymore to the increase of the unit cell size because it's too small, then start sensing its own image in the next unit cell. So effectively you increase the coverage in this way. So we try to choose it in such a way the cluster really feels like it's isolated. Does it answer it to you? Uh, so, um, yeah, so uh, is there any questions from the students or we can just open to the um, professors? Can we ask questions now or not? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, Anastasia, and I, start, um, I have a question about the time scale, right? Because uh, the, the whole simulation, as far as I, but one of the talk, very insightful. And then when I thought about this, um, the whole system is under the assumption that the matter stable, stable phase are um, time invariant during the lifetime of the um, turnover. And, yeah. and so, so in, 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 in that, therefore, what is the time scale you are talking about, about the matter level phase, how stable it should be, um, therefore your calculation would be applicable. Yeah. Excellent question, Chong, with incredible depth. Okay, so let me see, do I even, so what I've been telling you, let me illustrate what Chong is actually asking, because I have an illustration for that. So what, what we're saying is that catalyst always reorganizes and we have this full equilibration picture in every intermediate. But what if it's not full? What if it's not even accessible in time scales of catalytic turnovers? Then is my catalyst just traveling over some something that's closer to its initial structure? And we don't really have time to do that. We cannot answer this question each and every case because it's very expensive. At least at the moment, we don't have a technique that would do it routinely. Oops, let me... Um, I want to stop sharing and share something else. One second, because in my different presentation, which was intended to be much longer than that, I have answers to this, at least some of them. Um, okay, so the talk on material science the other day. Um, okay, so can the catalyst really reach all the states time scales? I'm prepared for it. <laughs> okay. So, I'll tell you know it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so one thing, we did few things to see whether our Boltzmann picture is adequate. Of course, it's probably imperfect, 
but is it better than global minimum picture only? And so one thing is this, I already showed you that at least for this particular system, we have this very low barrier interconversion and we assess the rate and we think it's very fast. Another thing, we did a couple of model studies where we have, so in this case, let's see, yes, we have two, two systems. One is just gas phase platinum 13 and another is copper cluster deposited on silica. So undergoing a collision with the reactant in reaction conditions. In other words, both the cluster and the reagent are at temperature of catalysis, meaning that much kinetic energy. And we direct my reagent at the catalyst and see, and of course can attach and dissociate or it can scatter. And what we see is how this IVR is happening, intermolecular evaporation energy uh, redistribution is happening. And what we're finding is that due to this collision and momentum exchange from with just one reagent molecule, we can create all sorts of isomerization events. This is platinum 13, and these are all different isomers that are populated just to, due to multiple admitted the trajectories, many, many trajectories of this colliding with, with, uh, with methane. And in this case, it's a similar story, but for dioxygen attacking copper clusters supported on silica. So also all sorts of uh, minima that are not seen on minimal energy profile. In other words, the, due to kinetic energy exchange with reagents, of course, there are very many of them at high pressures. We would have this constant isomerization as that are triggered due to kinetic energy exchange. And finally, we have this one paper where we showed that reorganization of catalyst can be coupled to the reaction coordinate directly. In other words, my reaction coordinate says not CH bone stretching, but CN bone stretching plus platinum is doing stuff. And that's very difficult to discover such reaction coordinates actually, because normally NAB strategy wouldn't get you there. So what we do, we fix my, my reaction at the transition state and sample the cluster under it. Okay. And we find a separate ensemble which we then connect forward and backward. And in this way, find low energy reaction profiles that involve platinum reorganization. So it lists through three different ways, normal thermal dynamics, uh, walking of reagents and coupling to reaction coordinate, we see a lot of reorganization. And then if we assume Boltzmann, close our eyes and assume Boltzmann, we agree with the experiment better. So, yeah. So, well, this is much more than I had expected, but but I because the reason is I, I usually try to have a time, um, an automatic time scale in mind saying that um, how, how within how soon, how fast that the thermal, thermal bath will be good enough to ensure that, but it looks like based on the simulation, does it mean that hundreds of picoseconds has been sufficient enough to allow this model to work well? Because uh, that's yeah. the time scale I, I was looking at from the data you have on the screen. Right, yes. So sub, sub picosecond is good enough. All right, okay, so okay. yes. Okay, yeah, great, thank you, Leah. Yeah, sure, yeah. Um, we now develop actually sort of master equation type of approaches where we, okay, yeah. we want to see, okay, maybe there are minima which are either inaccessible because they're separated by large barriers or they're separated by such shallow barriers that have no lifetime. And then our Boltzmann picture would have to be modified to exclude some things or, or on the contrary, overpopulate some things. And so we try to also approach them this way. So you can apply a bias, so to funnel it towards a certain state. Right, yeah. Okay. Or just excluded from the statistics. That's fair. Yeah, you can just yeah, inaccessible enough. Okay, thank you. Sure. I'll have to take you from here. Yeah, that's my group. Uh, contributors didn't have time for that. Yeah, this research requires a lot of computer resources, and ideally, all to uh, bow to them. <laughs> you know what I mean. So any other question? So if there's no questions, um, thank you guys for coming and- Thank yeah. you guys, nice discussion, thank you. <laughs>